nice to be here, and uh, I, I really uh, am grateful to uh, Roberto for the invitation to come here, and also to Paolo, uh, whom I have known for several years, both of them, in fact, they are old friends, I would say. Um, and uh, what I will do here today is to talk about uh, some of the things we do uh, uh, in my group. Um, in this case, um, related to, to machine learning. Uh, so we, we deal with, normally what we do is privacy and security, the interplay between privacy and security and other um, requirements about ethics, like fairness and explainability and these kind of things. But this talk is about the interplay in the case of, of machine learning. Um, so this will be the outline. I will introduce what the problem is. Um, then, basically, I would talk about privacy for a while because I am aware that some of you maybe are not familiar with privacy, uh, privacy history and technology. Then I will talk about uh, privacy attacks against machine learning and predictive learning, which is a decentralized version of machine learning. Um, I will then uh, show how a, a, a famous privacy model called differential privacy has been uh, adapted or twisted <laughs> to, to be used in, in machine learning um, uh, with uh, doubtful success, I would say. Uh, I will show how, how it has been uh, applied to centralized machine learning, how it has been applied also to decentralized machine learning. I will show our empirical results that, that uh, really um, demonstrate that you can do better than using differential privacy if you want to achieve privacy in, in machine learning while keeping accuracy at an acceptable level. Uh, then, then I will switch to uh, alternatives that seek to protect privacy without adding noise, uh, because differential privacy basically is noise addition. And uh, uh, I mean, refraining from using noise has the uh, attractive that it also allows to defend against security attacks. And this is what I will discuss in this last part, and then I will conclude. So, this is wh where did privacy uh, protection start? Well, um, some people could say that privacy came from the Greeks when they started uh, encrypting messages, uh, uh, etc., or Caesar. But in fact, um, privacy in the sense of data protection is rather recent. So it, the, the main interest started in the 1970s uh, with the development of uh, what is called statistical discursive control. This was a discipline that uh, was started by the, the official statisticians. Those people were the only ones before the uh, uh, widespread use of the web. Uh, the only organizations that were consistently collecting data were national statistical offices. And therefore, they had a commitment to, to, to privacy, to, to preventing uh, any answers from being, from being linkable to citizens that had provided them. This was uh, not just for ethical reasons, but also for practical reasons. If, if you are given a survey and uh, you are given no guarantees that uh, your answers will not be linked to you, maybe you, you, you will be tempted to lie. Okay? So if you want to get truthful answers, you need to uh, guarantee some kind of privacy to people. So. This was in the official statistics uh, world, but then in the late 90s, as you well know, there was the web explosion, uh, and everyone started collecting data. So everyone had to do something about the privacy, because otherwise people would be lying, or would be uncomfortable, at least, with the uh, data that, that had been collected, if they were shared or published. Uh, at this point, the computer scientists came into, into the, the, the field, and uh, they took a different approach from the statisticians. So the statisticians uh, had prioritized utility. So what they did, in a way, is withdraw uh, inch by inch. So let's, let's see uh, how much protection we need to give for the data not to be linkable to the respondents. And we, if with this amount of protection they are still linkable, we protect a little bit more, a little more, more noise. Uh, and now we check again whether they are linkable to the respondents or not, if they are stop, if they are, sorry, if they are not linkable, stop, if they are still linkable, a little more noise, and little by little we are losing utility to guarantee the bare amount of, of protection that is needed to protect privacy. That was the utility first, because uh, official decisions uh, uh, make a, a living out of providing useful data. 
So if they provide just protected data that are useless, uh, then people would close, well, the government would close them <laughs> down. And, and that, so they, they cannot do that. Um, then the, the computer scientists did a different, uh, took, took a different approach. Um, they used what is called privacy models. A privacy model is an ex-ante condition, ex-ante privacy condition. So you, say, you see, this is the condition I want to meet, and I will, um, with certain parameters, um, of course, there are two main models in, in history. <laughs> One is k-anonymity and its extensions, just an Italian uh, model, Fiorentino Samarati, and then uh, someone else, uh, Latani Sweeney. Um, k-anonymity is, is uh, uh, it, it, it is satisfied if uh, there are groups of K records um, that share the same attributes, um, the same demographic attributes, the same uh, values for the attributes that could be used to link the records to some guy. So if, if uh, when, you have, when you are looking for your neighbor's record, imagine you know that your neighbor is in a data set, you are looking, what is my neighbor's data set? And then, if the data set is protected using uh, the k-anonymity model, you will be confronted to k records that could be your neighbors. And you won't be able to decide which of the k records is your neighbors. Because the ages, the uh, zip codes, the professions, um, they will be replicated k times for each combination of values, okay? Um, and then you have differential privacy that I will uh, uh, discuss in a moment. So those are ex-ante privacy conditions, as I was uh, telling you. Um, and once the, the value of the parameter k or epsilon is chosen, the protector of the data makes sure the condition is satisfied, whatever the utility loss uh, is. So it, that's why it is called a privacy-first approach, because they care about enforcing the model, and then uh, let's see what utility remains after enforcing the model. Okay? So k-anonymity I have briefly explained. Now differential privacy is something that uh, was proposed uh, some years ago already. Uh, and uh, it, it has been very popular among academics. Uh, you should keep in mind that this fact does not mean things are true, the fact that things are popular among academics. Sometimes uh, they might be misleading. So this is the idea behind, this is the definition of differential privacy. The idea is that this was in originally proposed for uh, uh, an online uh, query setting in which uh, you query a database, you get statistical answers. What is the average age of people in the database? What is the maximum income of people in the database? These kind of, of queries. And uh, the idea was that the answers you got had to be nearly the same, no matter whether any single individual was in the database or not. So in mathematical terms, you have two databases, D1, D2, that differ in a single record. And then you are requiring by this expression that the distribution of the answers on one database be very similar to the distribution of the answers in the other database, okay? Uh, and uh, so that's the condition, basically. There is a tolerance factor, this is a, a exponential of epsilon, which means that, well, they have to be similar, those distributions, but you tolerate some difference, okay? Uh, if epsilon is zero, you are requiring that the distributions be exactly the same no matter whether any single guy is in or out. And this is strongest protection possible. This is equivalent to Shannon's uh, perfect secrecy, okay? So in that case, you can achieve, can achieve more. Um, and what, what, has this to, what, what has this to do with privacy? Well, any single citizen um, participating in the data set can be sure that his presence or his absence will not be noticed. So that's top privacy. So in, in fact, in terms of privacy, this idea of indistinguishability of distributions uh, when you are in or out is a very powerful one, okay? Uh, so how is this achieved? Because normally, um, this is not achieved. I mean, if you don't do anything on the data. Imagine that you have a data set on, 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 on the income in a village and Bill Gates or someone else comes to the village and starts being there as, as, as an inhabitant. Then, of course, the, the, the influence of that guy on the average income is huge. So what you need to do something to enforce the differential privacy condition. What will you do? Well, you will add noise to the answers that you provide. Uh, so instead of providing the real uh, average, you will, this is the real average, you will add noise to the average before communicating this to the user. And this noise will depend on two factors. One is the tolerance factor. So the, the higher the tolerance, 
the less noise you need to provide because uh, you tolerate more differences between the two distributions when the guy is in or out. And uh, there is another parameter, which is the sensitivity. Sensitivity means that if the query function is very changing, can change a lot with uh, the presence or absence of a single guy, then you need to add a lot of noise because the, 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 the values here of the real average will, or the query will change a lot. For example, a maximum query is more sensitive than an average query because the maximum query can be completely changed by the addition or the suppression of an individual. If Bill Gates comes to the village, maximum income grows a lot. If he leaves the village, the maximum income goes down a lot. Whereas the average, well, if Bill Gates comes to Jeddah, if it's a big city, well, then, then uh, well, the average is more robust. It, it is less, of course, it will increase uh, when Bill Gates comes here, but it will not increase as much as the maximum. So you need to add less noise for the, the average than for the maximum. It is less sensitive, okay? So that's the idea. Then there are two properties of differential privacy that are worth mentioning because they have an influence on what I will uh, explain later on. Uh, one is sequential composition. So if you combine the outputs of several queries uh, together and you publish, and publish them together, uh, and the queries are on non-independent data sets, um, and each query is epsilon i, uh, differential private, differentially private, uh, the combined output is protected under the addition of the epsilons. So it is less private. Remember, differential privacy offers more privacy when epsilon is low and less privacy when epsilon grows. So when I am saying that the combined outputs are addition of epsilon i differentially private, it means they are less private as a set than each individual output. So each individual output is epsilon i. The combined outputs are addition of uh, epsilon i. So the more, as you accumulate differentially private outputs, the privacy goes down, which is something that is rather intuitive, but this is the way it is. Then there is parallel composition, which is a, a special case in which uh, if you compute uh, outputs on M disjoint and independent data sets, um, well, as long as data sets are independent, uh, you still maintain the same level of privacy because uh, there is no, privacy does not weaken because uh, one query is on data set here and the other query is on the data set there. So you can combine both outputs with, without decreasing privacy because they concern uh, different uh, disjoint sets of individuals, okay? So uh, um, remarks on, on the value of the tolerance which is called uh, privacy budget. This is the, the jargon they use in differential privacy. Uh, as this uh, epsilon uh, value grows, the privacy guarantee fades away, of course. Uh, it means that you tolerate more differences when someone is in or out. Okay? Then that someone is less protected. Um, um, Apple or Google uh, have been deploying in practice differential privacy with very high levels of epsilon, um, as high as uh, eight or 14. Um, the designers of differential privacy recommended epsilon less than one. So eight or 14 is a lot because remember the tolerance is, ep is exponential of epsilon. So this means 2.71 power eight or 2.71 power 14. Um, if you had the Mac, there is a moment when you install the Mac uh, in which uh, they, uh, you get a, a, a question, uh, do you uh, accept that we collect your data? They will be protected with differential privacy. Okay, that's what they ask you. Uh, and it seems that differential privacy is the greenwashing story, but uh, they don't tell you that the parameters will be as high as that, which in practice means that the protection you will get is really low. Okay, but th that's what they have been, they have been doing. Also, there are other issues uh, due to sequential composition. When M queries are to be answered, if each query is differentially private, then the combined set is less private. And if you want to maintain the combined, uh, the privacy of the combined set of answers at epsilon level, you need to uh, add noise to each answer so that it is epsilon divided by M, which is much more noise, okay? So the thing is that, <laughs> The more outputs you want to collate together, the more noise you need to add to each single, uh, to each single uh, output, okay? So that's, that's the... Um, beyond query answering. So query answering was the original setting for differential privacy, but 
people were so happy about this uh, mathematically elegant formulation uh, and about this powerful uh, privacy notion that they tried to extend it to other application settings. Um, it was proposed, for example, to anonymize microdata releases, so uh, individual data sets like anonymity, uh, data sets where each uh, record, uh, where there are individual records, and, uh, and, uh, and this is, of course, different from uh, uh, answering queries, okay? Uh, it was also proposed to use uh, uh, it to anonymize microdata collection, which is what Apple uh, do when they ask uh, you whether you accept collection. So they take your transactions and they, <laughs> they collect uh, uh, individual transactions on you. Uh, and it was also proposed to use differential privacy in machine learning to protect the individual data used to train uh, machine learning models, because it, it is a problem. You, a lot of machine learning models get trained on personal data, and uh, you will soon realize, uh, either you know already or you will realize in this talk that uh, a trained model can leak the, the, the data it was trained on. So if the data are personal, then this is a problem. Um, so these are the, the, the ambitions that people had. And uh, let's focus on, on machine learning. Uh, and, uh, and centralized and also uh, a decentralized version of machine learning that's called federated learning. Uh, so if you train uh, a model in a centralized manner, you are, what you do is you gather all training data, you train the model, and that's it. So then if there is any privacy concern, it is at the, at the time when you gather the data. Okay? Uh, so <laughs> if people are willing to give you their data for you to train the model in a centralized manner, that's over. They consent, they give you the, their data, and, and you train the model, okay? Uh, there can be still, in this case, external attackers that once you train the model and publish it, uh, leverage the model to infer things about the data that were used at training time. Okay, so it is not that centralized learning is free of privacy attacks. If you use a decentralized approach, uh, like federated learning, or the even more decentralized, fully decentralized machine learning in which there are several parties, each of them uh, train their own models with the help of the others, uh, uh, well, you gain scalability because you, you have many uh, uh, participants helping in the training process, with each with their own data. Um, and there is also some privacy, some client privacy the participants keep their local data private. They don't need to surrender those data to the model manager. So that gives some privacy in principle, unless uh, the model is so complex that, the, that it can memorize the local training data. Okay? If you use traditional models, uh, like uh, these decision trees or, 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 or uh, random forests, where well, those, those models are simple enough not to memorize the training data, in an accurate way. But if you use deep, deep learning, well, you might have a problem because deep learning has a lot of weights, and the weights, in fact, memorize the training data if, unless the training data are small, are big. Sorry, if the training data are, are small, they can be memorized. Um, so when you use deep learning, the, the model updates sent by clients, we'll see, uh, in a moment I will explain how federated learning works, you will see that there are updates that clients send to the model manager based on their local data. So those updates that you send as a client can leak your local training data. Uh, we, uh, there is a survey we published on that uh, in this reference. I will leave the presentation to Roberto for him to distribute. Um, so this is federated learning, just for you to be on the same page. There is a, a, a model manager that starts distributing uh, an initial model that in principle has all weights, let's say, set to zero. So there is an initial model that's very silly. Uh, the model is distributed to a set of participants that uh, have each of them their local data here. And those participants run the model on their local data, uh, use it to predict their local data and see how well it works. And then they send a correction, they send an update of the model to the model manager. The model manager averages all the updates that it has received and computes a new version of the general model. It distributes this new version again to the participants. The participants run the new version, see how well it works, 
send a new correction, and again, there is a second general model that is distributed again uh, with the corrections by the model manager, and so on. And the process ends when the successive general models that are computed uh, more or less are the same, when they are stable, when they converge. Uh, when the models do not change in successive iterations, then you are done. The learning process is finished. Okay? Each iteration is called an epoch, uh, and uh, that's how it works. Okay? There are several ways to, to mix the updates. The simplest one is to take the average okay, of, of the received updates. Um, now, what are the privacy attacks you could imagine in this, in this setting here? Um, I mean, a, a naive idea would be that since uh, local data remain with each participant, no privacy problem. But this is not true. Uh, both in centralized and decentralized machine learning, uh, you can mount privacy attacks. In, in, in centralized machine learning, uh, people that see the trained model can try to infer things. In federated learning, uh, um, there is some client privacy because the clients do not need to surrender. But uh, the model updates may allow inferences on the local data of clients. Uh, okay. Again, the, in this survey, we, we give more uh, highlights on, on that. Sorry, I sorry, I was I think I went uh, um, backwards. So here, sorry, <laughs> the privacy attacks that are uh, of concern here is on the one side membership inference attacks. Uh, they uh, try to determine whether a given record was present in the data set that was used for training. Uh, this might look like a weak attack because uh, compared to the re-identification. So in anonymization, we want to find out who is the person behind a certain record. So that is really ambitious. In this case, we just want to know whether someone's record was in the training data. We don't, know, we don't want to know which record it is. We just want to know whether that record was or not in the training data. There are scenarios in which uh, this is, however, privacy uh, sensitive. For example, imagine that uh, there is a, a, a drug uh, test in a hospital, or, um, and, and you know that someone's record is in the training, in the test data, among, in, in the test data set. Well, it means that person suffers from a condition uh, that's that's going to be cured by the drug. So knowing that someone is in means that someone has a, a health condition, and this is already sensitive. And there are other, many other cases in which just knowing that someone's record is in the data set, even without knowing the record, is sensitive. Okay? But still, this is a most, it's the simplest privacy attack that you can mount on machine learning. Okay? Uh, in uh, decentralized learning, well, if you mount uh, a series of, of membership inference attacks, you can eventually disclose all the training data set. Because is this guy's record in or not? Yes, uh, cross, this guy is in. Is that guy's record in the data set? Yes or no? No, nothing. Yes, cross, again, second guy. So in the end, by asking several times, mounting a, a succession of membership inference attacks, you could even reconstruct the, 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 the training data uh, in the case of federated learning. Um, uh, there is also another type of attacks which are attitude inference attacks. Uh, in this case, the adversary uses a machine learning model and then incomplete information about a, a, a record, uh, someone's record, to infer the missing information. Uh, for example, if the adversary is given partial information about an individual's medical record and attempts to infer the individual genotype, by using a model train on similar medical records. So you can interpolate, you can uh, uh, what they call um, but, uh, impute uh, the, the, the value of the missing attribute by using a model that has been run on similar records uh, and then the model predicts the, the attribute value that is missing. Okay? Uh, you can also use membership inference attacks to uh, uh, infer uh, some, some uh, unknown attributes. For example, in this case, you could infer that uh, uh, if you, you, you do some uh, membership inference attacks for people like that, and the only guy that is uh, in the data set is this one, you infer that the age, the age is, is 31 to 35, okay? So there are still uh, worse attacks, uh, uh, in case of uh, images especially. Uh, they are very spectacular. Reconstruction attacks. 
Uh, here, uh, they are called also model inversion attacks. So you take the train model and you try to reconstruct, uh, in, like if the model was a function, that from the prediction and the model, you go back to the training data. So this would be um, an example of a, a, an original image that was used in training, and this is the reconstructed image, which cannot be distinguished from the original one. So these things uh, can be mounted, especially in the case of images, um, by using uh, generative adversarial networks uh, that are very useful to reconstruct uh, content. Okay? So there are privacy problems in, 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 in machine learning, and this was the idea uh, I wanted to motivate this. In fact, many of these privacy problems uh, have to do with overfitting. Overfitting means uh, uh, learning too well uh, <laughs> the training data. Uh, in in uh, French, this is called surapprentissage, uh, which means uh, overlearning, uh, learning too well. It's like a student that just learns the, the, the exercises that have been given to him by the professor, and then when uh, he or she is given some other exercise at the exam, cannot do anything, has no clue. Well, learning too well is not so good sometimes because if your life is limited to what you learn and nothing else. Okay? So in machine learning, it is also bad. Uh, overfitting uh, has been shown to predict the attacker's advantage. Uh, in fact, this is quite easy to understand. If the model learned the data, training data so well, Seeing the trained model is like seeing the training data in the end, okay? So what is the attacker's advantage? Uh, well, it's the difference between the two positive rate and the false positive rate. Uh, when this is very high, the attacker is doing very well, okay? Uh, in, in black box attacks, um, the prediction probabilities for any classifiers uh, are used to determine membership. Uh, you know, when, when you, use, you, you want to use this, this uh, uh, number, handwritten number uh, data sets uh, where the classification problem is to decide whether this is 0, 1, or 9. Uh, well, uh, you have a deep learn learning model. Typically, it has 10 neurons at the, at the end, and there is uh, the neuron associated to 0, the one associated to 1, till the neuron associated to 9. And in the end, when you are giving a, an image to the model, you get probabilities that this is 0, that this is 1, that this is 2, that this is 9. Well, and, and then you take as, as the result the highest the, the probability, the label associated to the highest probability, okay? Uh, well, it turns out that uh, uh, when you use, uh, uh, when, when you run, you, you test a, a trained model with uh, uh, test data uh, that include the training data, uh, it turns out that in the case of the training data, the model recognizes very well. Uh, it gives very crisp probabilities. So if, if you include one of image of nine that was used in the training data, the nine will be recognized with a spike here in the, in the probability. So it will be very clear that this is nine. So uh, it, it is very easy when you feed uh, a, a, an input data to the model to know whether this training data was in the training data, whether this input data was in the training data or not. When you take the spike, oh, this was in the training data set when you see a rather flat distribution with a slight uh, advantage for one of, the lab, one of the labels, then you can think, well, this was not in the training data. So that's a way when the model is overfit, and this happens especially when the model is overfit. If the model is not overfit, those differences are less obvious. So then for overfit models, it is just a matter of feeding a lot of candidate data to the model and then finding out where, where the spikes are. And, and, and you can't reconstruct the, the training data. So that, that, that's, that's the thing. That's the connection between overfitting and, and privacy uh, leakage, okay? Um, let me show you uh, just two short videos on what happens uh, with the information loss during training in case of no overfitting and in case of overfitting. So this is the... This is the, the, the way in which the, the uh, loss, the, the, the loss when learning, is distributed among uh, data that were in the training data set and data that were not in the training data set. So you see that in, in, a, in case of no overfitting, uh, the losses are very homogeneous. Uh, no matter where the records 
where part of the training data, the, the, the yellow points, well, the points and the crosses, so I, colors are not my business, so the points and the crosses, uh, they have similar uh, errors. Uh, there is no clear distinction between the errors for points in the training data and for points that were not in the training data. Now, if you take the, the, uh, uh, a, a model that is overfit, the, the situation changes uh, significantly. So here you have I mean, the, 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 what happens here in time is the number of epochs, so as the model learns, okay? And uh, the video ends when the model has completed learning. So here is the case uh, in which there is overfitting. So you see, the crosses are the points that were in the training data. And in the end, there is no loss for the, those points. Whereas for the other points, there is a variety of losses. So you quickly, you quickly identify which points were in the training data by taking those that have very low loss. Okay. So this is a bad thing of overfitting. So let, let me go back to the presentation. Now, um, people realizing that there was a privacy problem tried to find solutions. And the solution that they first uh, came up with was, oh, why don't we apply this fashionable thing of differential privacy to try to fix the problem? Um, well, what they did uh, was to apply differential privacy to the gradients, that, that is to the updates that are sent uh, in case of federated learning, okay? Um, now, there's the first problem here. Uh, since successive model training epochs, the iterations, are computed on the same training data, or at least on partly overlapping training data, uh, you need to uh, take sequential composition into account. So epsilon grows with the number of training epochs. So as, as, as the training proceeds more and more, the level of privacy you achieve is lower. Okay? So that is the first, uh, first uh, con that you have here. So if you want to deliver some privacy, the epsilon at each epoch must be very small in order to take care of the sequential composition. You start with very small uh, epsilon per epoch, which means a lot of noise that you need to inject into the gradients at each epoch. Now, injecting a lot, a lot of noise to each gradient at each epoch causes those gradients to differ a lot from what the real gradients should be. So there is a loss of accuracy, and there is also uh, you, you need more epochs to converge because you are altering the gradients at each epoch. So you need more epochs to, for the gradients to stabilize. Okay. And, uh, and more epochs also means more sequential composition. So this is a vicious circle and it's a disaster. So uh, uh, adding more noise per epoch, more epochs, uh, and in the end, uh, a, a, a very substantial loss in accuracy. Okay. So that's, that, that is a, a first problem you have with uh, using differential privacy uh, on gradients. Um, then there are some strategies to reduce the amount of noise that is needed that people have figured out. Uh, one is gradient truncation. Because, you know, one of the, I, I, I told you that there were two parameters uh, that influenced on noise. One was the epsilon value, the other was the sensitivity. How, how much could the magnitude to be protected change with a single, with, when someone was in or out? If you truncate the maximum value and the minimum value for gradients, then the sensitivity decreases because you are artificially limiting the sensitivity. You are artificially limiting the, the maximum change. Okay, that's a way. It's a, a bit of cheating, but well, maybe um, if gradients are like that, well, you can uh, truncate to this maximum level and, and you can also, instead of zero, you can just leave it here and, and it is enough. So you still can learn. Uh, maybe more slowly, but you can still learn. Uh, then other strategies uh, are prior subsampling. Uh, instead of computing gradients on the whole uh, data set, you compute gradients on a sample of the data set with the hope that the maximum values will be, will be slow, lower and the minimum values will be higher. So if, instead of computing on the whole range of data, you take a sample, uh, you are in a way truncating <laughs> uh, also the gradients. So it's another way to reduce sensitivity. And another strategy, yet another strategy, is to use, instead of the original definition of, of uh, differential privacy, 
use relaxations of it, like uh, epsilon delta differential privacy, which uh, means that differential privacy is enforced with probability one minus delta. So it might be the case that it is not enforced. Okay, so it's one minus delta. Uh, that's a relaxation. There are other relaxations like concentrated differential privacy, Rennie differential privacy, etc. And uh, there are there's yet another strategy which is um, bound the cumulative growth of epsilon across epochs using a, a method that call, that's called the moments accountant. Uh, they say uh, uh, when you accumulate uh, epsilon by sequential composition, you are taking the worst case. Uh, it's like in error uh, um, um, propagation. When you take, uh, if you have done some physics or chemi chemistry, uh, you see when you are computing how error can propagate with scientific computations, you always take the worst case. Uh, and then what if you take the average case? Then the, the error grows less. And uh, so this moments accountant is like accumulating the uh, uh, epsilons but taking the average case instead of the extreme case, which allows you to uh, give more decent uh, fi uh, fi figures. Instead of epsilon growing to the tens or twenties, you, you are still left in single figure. Uh, epsilons after the, using this accountant uh, uh, method. Whether this is, uh, uh, well, this is more or less uh, legit, but, uh, but we, we could talk about that. But this is something they do. Uh, now, uh, with all the, those uh, countermeasures, uh, they, um, well, they can apply to centralized machine learning, for example, and you can use differential privacy on three different, in three different stages. Uh, sometimes it can be used at, at the input of learning, so uh, you protect the training data by differential privacy before using them for training, okay? And then, since you are training on protected data, the whole thing will be protected. Uh, it is also possible to protect intermediate results by uh, protecting the updates, as I have suggested a moment ago. So you add noise to the updates. This is what I discussed uh, a moment ago. Or you could uh, protect the learning model, the, the model once it has been trained. So you do nothing about privacy in the training process, but after training, before releasing the model, you alter, you add some noise to the model to protect privacy. So there are three stages, input, uh, intermediate results, and output, okay? Um, so that's, that's, those are the three moments. Um, and here, well, it's a bit small for you to see, but I will tell you, sorry, it was hard to fit this here. Um, this is an analysis of a literature. Um, uh, on, on differential privacy in centralized machine learning. You see that, uh, well, those papers, some of which are still rather recent, they achieve epsilons, uh, single digit epsilons, uh, thanks to the moments accountant, because they use this special way of, of accumulating epsilon. Um, often, however, they exceed uh, eight, which is a lot. It means that uh, the difference between both distributions when someone is in or out, in or out can be a factor of uh, 2 to the 0.71 power 8. So this is a lot. <laughs> when you say epsilon 8, it doesn't look that much. But when you look at the, realize that this is exponential of 8, this is a lot. Um, it must also be taken into account that the attacker's advantage, that the, the difference between the true positive rate and the false positive rate, is uh, upper bounded by epsilon, by exponential of epsilon minus 1. So this is an upper bound. You could say, well, an upper bound doesn't worry me because it is an upper bound. But it is not, it is a rather tight upper bound. <laughs> it is not a, a very bad upper bound. So if the upper bound grows, it means that the real thing also grows. It's not that uh, I'm giving a, a trillion upper bound uh, and then the real thing is one or two. Okay, it, it is really rather tight. So, and also they use delta that uh, is close or larger than uh, one divided by n, when, where n is the number of records in the training data. What's the implication of this? Uh, they use this relaxation epsilon delta differential privacy, which is differentially private with probability one minus delta. So if delta is bigger than one over n, it means that for sure, for at least one record, there is no differential privacy. So if I give you, let's say, uh, take delta 0, 0, 001, if I have uh, 90 rec uh, sorry, if I have um, um, 1,000 records, it means that on average, 10 records 
uh, out of the 1,000 are not protected. Okay, so it is a bad practice to use delta larger than uh, one divided by n. Okay, so that's that's a uh, but people do that to survive because otherwise, <laughs> if they don't do that, the figures they can present they are bad, and some of those papers. Uh, Pap or not, and the others, they are by Google people. So it's, it's not that those people are written by any, anyone. They are top people writing these kind of things. Uh, okay, that's. Um, when they switch to decentralized machine learning, uh, you can do decentralized machine learning uh, and protect it uh, with differential privacy in three different ways, at least. One is local differential privacy, what is known in this case, differential privacy is applied locally by each client, by each participant, to obtain uh, what, is, what, it's, what is called instance level uh, privacy. Instance level privacy means that uh, the, the subject of privacy is each record in the local data. For example, imagine that there are several hospitals doing machine learning, uh, federated learning, uh, to jointly compute a model on their patients without exchanging their patient data. Uh, then. The, the privacy that matters here is the privacy of each patient in each hospital. Within, it's not the hospital's privacy, it's the patient's privacy inside the hospital. In this case, the patient is an instance. It's instance level, pri pri patient privacy is instance level privacy because it's the privacy of one instance, one patient inside each participant, which is the hospital, okay? So you can do that uh, using local differential privacy at the hospital level, okay? To protect each patient. You can add DP noise to the updates, and you can maybe use DP stochastic gradient descent during local training. Then you can also adopt a, a, what is called a central differential privacy in, in decentralized machine learning. I know this is a, a bit puzzling, but the idea is that the model manager that collects all the updates in federated learning hides the presence or absence uh, of any client. This would be uh, if uh, instead of having hospitals, you have um, smartphones that are used to jointly learn a machine mo learning model based on, on the local smartphone data, for example, fitness data of the, the owner. In this case, what matters is the privacy of the whole smartphone because as one smartphone corresponds to one person, the owner. So in this case, you need participant level privacy, also called client. Clients and participants are the same. So in this case, what matters is the privacy not of the records because they all correspond to the same patient, to the same uh, person. Uh, fitness data for, on, my, on me are stored in my smartphone. I don't want each record in my fitness data, the run I did yesterday or tomorrow. I want all my data to be protected because it's, they are data about me. Okay? So in this case, what matters is whether I was in the learning process or not uh, at the client level. So this is central differential privacy. It depends on, on the application. In the case of the hospitals, a local differential privacy would be more appropriate. In the case of smartphones, it's uh, this central differential privacy that is more appropriate. I hope you, you gather the, the difference. And uh, there is yet another way to protect it, which is even stricter, which is uh, to withhold the local model. In this case, the client does not give any updates to the uh, uh, model manager, but the client collaborates in predictions. So you have a prediction to do as a model manager, and then you ask, uh, tell me what you would predict. And the model manager asks everyone, and in the end, conducts a voting among the predictions. So that, this is like a random forest in the end, uh, but this is, uh, in a way, the, 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 the best way to protect uh, everything, because you give nothing except the help in the predictions. Of course, it is a poorer way to learn, because uh, in a way, you are voting, uh, which is not a very <laughs> uh, uh, fine-grained way. Okay? Uh, what, are the, what is the state of the art in, uh, dif in, in the use of differential privacy in federal learning? Well, you have here, again, another table that is hard to read, but uh, I can tell you uh, what it is about. Uh, again, most of the epsilon values are eight, uh, and most of the delta uh, are um, in fact, uh, 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 bigger than, than one divided by n. Uh, here you have the number of, of clients, you have the deltas. Um, if you, well, and uh, if the number of clients, there is a difference regarding the number of clients. If you have uh, few clients, few participants, as you would have in the case of the hospitals I was mentioning, 
uh, well, there is a significant impact on accuracy uh, when you use differential privacy. If you have a large number of clients, as you would have if clients are smartphones, of which you can have millions, then uh, if uh, uh, there is no that much impact because there are so many people that the noise compensates uh, uh, across uh, clients. But also, <laughs> a disappointing uh, uh, remark is that when there are so many clients, you don't need privacy in, real, in reality because you are protected by the sheer amount of people. So if you are uh, running a model on one million, two million smartphones, uh, the presence or absence of any single guy is hard to notice because of the sheer amount of, of, of smartphones. So you don't need differential privacy or anything in that case. So, uh, and then you have, as uh, I was mentioning in a talk with uh, uh, Rihanna, the case of non-IID data. When you have that some of the clients has data that are very differently, differently distributed from other clients, uh, this is a problem. You can just take that uh, update at face value and up merge it with the other updates and don't care. Uh, or you can start thinking maybe this guy is trying to disrupt the learning process and this update is bad, it should be discarded. Uh, so that, then you have some issues, okay? Uh, that we can discuss later in the questions if you want. Then what are our empirical results? How good is the protection, uh, uh, the trade-off between protection and accuracy provided by the use of differential privacy uh, compared to other possibilities, to other techniques? So what we did was to uh, take uh, different data sets, uh, compute, assess the protection against membership inference attacks, and also measure the test accuracy, how good the model is uh, when confronted with test data different from the training data. Um, and we used two approaches for privacy protection. One was differential privacy, the other one was uh, uh, anti-overfitting techniques. Okay? I will give a brief uh, uh, note on that. Uh, we used centralized machine learning, but what the conclusions we reached are also valid for decentralized machine learning. Data sets we consider adult, MNIST, uh, uh, Cypher, and Cypher 10 with uh, Cypher 10 and Cypher 10 and transfer learning. Uh, more details are in this paper that just came out in ACM computing surveys. Um, well, just a brief note on anti-overfitting techniques. Uh, there are two main techniques uh, that are being used to prevent overfitting when learning, uh, when training a deep learning model. One is a dropout. Uh, dropout means uh, suppressing some of the connections between uh, layers in, in a neural network at the time of learning. So you learn all these. There are weights associated to each connection, and you put uh, some of the weights to zero, uh, which means you discard the, those, those links, okay? Um, in fact, there are several algorithms to choose the, 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 the connections to, to be suppressed. In most uh, machine learning libraries, this is a, a black box. <laughs> you don't really have much control. You, you give a parameter for dropout, and the, 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 the library chooses the best uh, uh, connections to, to drop. Um, but it normally works well. Uh, we, in the paper, we give details uh, about what the library we used, what were the parameters, etc. And then you have uh, uh, L2 or L1 regularization. Regularization is another way to fight uh, uh, overfitting. So you have, in fact, that uh, you add a term, uh, which is the penalty, to the loss function. So if you just take care of the loss function when learning, there are a lot of chances that you end up overfitting because you want to minimize the, the loss in all the training data. But then you add another term which, is, which, which penalizes this uh, overfitting. So you have two competing objectives. One is minimize the loss and the other is minimize the penalty. Uh, and this uh, prevents the model from getting too close to the uh, training data, okay? Um, then what are the results? Uh, for the adult data set, we took 75% dropout we didn't use regularization, and we found that this reduced the attacker's advantage by 35% and improved test accuracy. So not only uh, we reduced the attacker's advantage in membership inference attacks, so we increased privacy, but we also improved test accuracy. So two things in one. Uh, for MNIST, same parameters, we reduced the attacker's advantage by 67%, 
and we improve test accuracy. Again, there was a win-win here. For CIFAR, we combined, this was the best choices we found, of course, this is the best we could do. Uh, for CIFAR 10, 25% dropout and L2 regularization, we improved test accuracy by 4% and uh, reduced advantage by uh, 84%. For CIFAR 10 transfer learning, 25% dropout gave that we reduced, in this case, we didn't manage to improve test accuracy, we reduced it by in a very small terms, 1%, but we reduced the advantage by 71%. So that was with anti-overfitting. When we used differential privacy, just to compare how effective it was, uh, well, we use in this case uh, epsilon delta differential privacy applied to stochastic gradient descent. Uh, we used the moments account and we did things as people in Google do. Uh, we used delta 10 to the minus uh, six which in this case uh, was less than one divided by n because we had less than one million records. Uh, we tried several ranges of epsilon values, so the, the, the safe ones less than one, the usual values in the literature from two to eight, and the weak values above eight. And uh, we clipped gradients, uh, we truncated them at maximum norm uh, 2.5 because to limit sensitivity. And uh, it found, we found out that PP is good at reducing attacker's advantage for all epsilon. Uh, in fact, even for the large epsilon, it provides enough protection. We have to be fair about that. Uh, it does like anti-overfitting. So from the privacy protection, there is no difference. Uh, the difference comes uh, in the test accuracy. So differentially privacy substantially reduces test accuracy much more than anti-overfitting, even for weak epsilon. So it protects, but it protects at a higher price in terms of accuracy than entire overfitting. Uh, also, another problem is that if, when you use differential privacy on, on, the, on the gradients, um, it is very hard to adjust hyperparameters to achieve a certain specific uh, epsilon. So you say, I want to set for epsilon eight, and then you do, 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 and uh, you, you are not in full control of what happens, and in the end, you achieve another epsilon that may be less or more than the target epsilon. So that, that's controlling what's happening is not easy. Uh, also clipping gradients before noise addition eliminates the performance of using GPUs for processing training data in batches. So you need to, do, you, you, you lose, I mean you increase the execution time. But that, those are marginal things. Uh, the, the big thing is the, the loss of accuracy. Now, I'm coming to the end of the talk. Uh, is adding noise the only way to protect privacy in uh, machine learning? Um, and the answer is no. Uh, we can use noiseless alternatives, and, uh, uh, and this has some advantages, as I will argue. For, of course, you need some additional assumption, and the assumption here is that peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication between clients is possible. If this is possible, then a whole uh, 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 in fact, range of, of new techniques uh, are, are feasible. Um, we will, I will discuss two of them, unlinkable updates and fragmented federated learning in very brief terms. Uh, the advantage, the basic advantage of, of uh, avoiding noise addition is that the model manager still sees the original updates as they were computed by the participants. And this allows protecting against security attacks. I will briefly mention security attacks, and you will see that to defend against security attacks, it is necessary to see the real updates, not the noise added updates. Uh, so first, a primer on security attacks. Uh, there are two main security attacks in, in, in machine learning. Uh, one is called, uh, well, two main lines of attack. One is called untargeted poisoning. This is also called Byzantine attacks. Uh, I don't know whether you know the, the history behind this idea of, of Byzantine, the, the name Byzantine. It is not very uh, fair for the poor Byzantine people. In the, you know, this, this was the former Roman Empire of, of the East. And uh, it, this empire had a long uh, history of decay. They were losing land and land. And it seems the, the, the reason was that the Byzantine generals kept arguing with each other all the time and they never took the right decisions because they never agreed. And uh, now <laughs> it, this has been used, this idea of Byzantine non-agreement, 
for uh, attacks in this case, in which uh, there are participants that provide random updates that are not real with the, 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 the goal of preventing convergence. So you're saying preventing agreement, which is another way. So you send any update uh, that has nothing to do with your local data or with the reality just to disrupt the learning process and prevent convergence. That is one, one that's why they are called untargeted. You don't have any, you don't want to, to bring the model to, 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 to misclassify in a certain way. You just want to prevent convergence. That's, that's, you want to just make the thing explode, okay? So that, that's untargeted. And then you have targeted poisoning uh, in which you try to steer the learning process to certain uh, misclassifications, okay? Uh, and, that, and within this targeted approach, there are two main goals. One is label flipping attacks and the others are backdoor attacks. Label flipping attacks are, aimed, are uh, misclassifying uh, items. For example, you have these handwritten figures, uh, numbers, zero to nine. You want that uh, all eights are classified as six. If you want to do that, well, you need to mount a label flipping attack that flips the label eight to six, and maybe the label six to eight, okay? So that would be, uh, we have been publishing a paper about defenses against label flipping attacks that, that is about to be appear in neural networks. Um, so there are a whole range of defenses, but those defenses need to see the real updates. That, that's the lesson. And uh, the other attacks are the backdoor attacks. Backdoor attacks, uh, the idea that uh, you have a, an image, let's say uh, uh, number seven, but then you change two or three pixels in the image and the, the sevens without that change will be classified as seven, whereas the seven with this small imperceptible change in the image will be classified as five, for example. So when there is this backdoor, when there is this small change, uh, there is a misclassification. When there is no backdoor, there is no misclassification. So these are the, the, the other type of attacks. Uh, we, we got a best paper award for a paper uh, about defending uh, against uh, these kind of attacks by analyzing uh, layer by layer uh, at, at layer level the, the updates that are sent. But you need to see them, okay? So just uh, for, as a summary, this is uh, uh, label flipping. Uh, basically, you have here that uh, uh, at training, you do some cheating here, uh, you send some poisoned updates, and uh, the effect is that these zeros are classified as ones, uh, which were, this is the, was the, the target label of the, attack, uh, the, the attacker, okay? So that's uh, very bad. And uh, this is uh, poisoning, but this is, sorry, backdoor attacks. Uh, you train the data with poison uh, images. Uh, this small square means that you change few pixels in this square that are the backdoor. So then at test time, uh, the twos and fives without, uh, poison, without backdoors will be correctly classified, whereas the twos and fives with the backdoors will be wrongly classified, in this case, as zeros, because that was what we tried to do uh, when poisoning the training data, okay? Um, so there is a conflict uh, between privacy and security defenses. Security defenses are based on the model manager detecting outlying updates that are, look strange uh, compared to the other updates uh, uh, or by assessing uh, how incorporating a certain update degrades the model accuracy. Uh, and that's costly, but this is a one approach. So you take the model you had, you add the new update, and you see whether the resulting model is worse than the previous one. If it is worse, you say this update is no good, out. That's, that's, but this requires adding testing and it takes uh, some effort, okay? Uh, just uh, using some outlying criterion is cheaper, okay? Um, privacy defenses, on the other hand, are based on the workers, on the clients, clients, workers, participants is the same. Uh, sorry for using different words, but in the literature you will find workers, clients, and participants uh, as synonyms. Uh, the idea in this case is either to securely aggregate updates so that when they reach the, the model manager, no individual updates are visible anymore, but just aggregations, or adding noise to them. Then you, the model manager still sees individual updates, but not the original ones, but noise added. 
uh, updates. And then, of course, um, if you want the manager to see the updates for security, but you don't want the manager to see updates for privacy, you have a problem. So it, it is a sort of conflict. Um, and then that's why we try to provide some solutions here, assuming that uh, clients, participants, workers <laughs> could communicate with each other. Um, and this is the first approach I'll describe in a single slide or two slides. Um, I am already finishing 31 of 36, so <laughs> it's, it's ending. Uh, so in this case, uh, we assume that there is peer-to-peer -peer communications uh, to break, they can use to break the relationship between clients and their updates, okay? And this provides unlinkability between updates and the client and the worker who generated each update. Uh, we could, of course, use, uh, uh, we can build our own peer-to-peer -peer anonymous channel uh, using some reputation incentives. We, we have a paper on that. Um, or you could, we could use external infrastructures such as Tor for anonymous communication or, or blockchain for incentives. But this is overly complicated because you have no control on those external infrastructures. So sometimes it's, it's better to set up your local thing with reputations and ensure people communicate without access to big uh, red nodes uh, out there. Um, okay, so the thing there is, is simple. Here you have uh, a client that generates an update and instead of sending uh, the update to the model manager, which is this one here, the client sends the update to another client in the peer-to-peer -peer network. This other client may decide to directly send the update to the model manager or to forward it again to a second client. And maybe the second client decides to forward already the update to the uh, model manager or it could still decide to forward it to another, uh, yet another client. So the important thing is that when the model manager gets an update, uh, has no, he has no idea uh, about who was the generator for that update. So that gives unlinkability. There is still uh, a, a, a problem that may arise. And uh, we are assuming here that first, there is communication among clients, okay? And second, that seeing the updates is not a problem. Because if just seeing the update allows you to identify who a generator was, because it has a very extreme value or whatever, then this approach doesn't work, okay? Because uh, uh, we are assuming the value of the update is not confidential if you manage to unlink it from the generator's identity. Uh, now, we came up with this fragmented federated learning which solves the, the problem of, of disclosing the update value. In this case, each client splits her update into random fragments Fragments are encrypted under the model manager's key. Workers, clients or participants, <laughs> exchange fragments. Uh, and the model manager receives all encrypted fragments and decrypts them, but he does not know which fragment comes from whom. Uh, but it doesn't matter, because as long as you get all the fragments, in the end, what you need is to add all fragments together. It doesn't matter whether you get one fragment this way, the other fragment that way. You wait till you get all fragments, you add all them, all fragments up, and you get the real uh, aggregated update. Only you never saw the individual original fragments um, updates, you just saw fragments. But it's, since the thing is additive in the end, you, you don't need to show uh, the individual full fragments, full updates, but just fragments. Uh, this is about to appear in IT for transactions on neural networks and learning systems. Uh, and uh, it's still, however, the fragmentation does not prevent detection of poison fragments. Because if we, you lost the ability to detect poison fragments, then the business would be uh, no business, in fact. But, but here you still can, and we have shown that this, this is feasible. Uh, so graphically, this is the idea. You have two participants here that uh, have uh, uh, updates. They fragment their updates they uh, encrypt the, those fragments, they exchange uh, in a random way fragments among themselves and with other participants, they send the encrypted random fragments to the uh, model manager, uh, this guy decrypts because everything is encrypted under the manager's public key and gets the original fragments only in a different order. So here there are fragments from uh, uh, 
one participant, from another participant, from another participant. So, and but in the end, what counts is aggregation, and uh, the, the manager gets the, the full fragments. And this takes us to the conclusions. Um, so, summarize this long presentation is that uh, um, the machine learning community has embraced differential privacy rather uncritically, I would say, uh, as the gold standard for privacy protection. Um, but no one in the machine learning literature employs the original differential privacy definition, but relaxations of it. Privacy parameters are far from what was considered safe by the differential privacy inventors, which was epsilon below one, and, that's, and delta negligible uh, compared to the size of the training data. Uh, and then for such implementations, the privacy guarantees of original differential privacy, the idea that the presence or absence of any single guy should not be detectable from the outputs, no longer hold. Okay? Uh, so uh, what you have basically is that differential privacy, when used in that way, is just noise addition. Therefore, it is deceptive to just hide behind the label differential privacy. It's like when they tell you, uh, well, this is a plastic bottle, no problem, it's recyclable. Recyclable, no, 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 not recycled. <laughs> so this is like trying to, it's greenwashing. The greenwashing happens all the time, and privacy washing as well, okay? Uh, empirical privacy analysis are needed. So when you use differential privacy just as noise addition, you are not exempted from conducting empirical uh, analysis to make sure what is the level of privacy you are really offering. Don't hide behind the differential privacy label. Uh, just show how, how private the thing is empirically, okay? Uh, so what we have also seen is that the privacy security trade-off of using differential privacy in machine learning is worse than that of using entire overfitting, at least for some parameters, uh, to the point that, uh, uh, in fact, if you use epsilon less than one, as you should in differential privacy, you will get no uh, uh, accuracy whatsoever. Okay? And there are, under certain assumptions, that uh, participants can, com can com communicate noiseless alternatives that are compatible with security defenses. Okay? And, and, and this is important for decentralized learning. So you can have protection for the participants, and protect, which means privacy, and protection for the model manager, which means security. Okay? So you can have uh, it all. And uh, yeah, so thank you.